Give us a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, three. Yay! All right. <laughs> okay. And that's how you make an ESOP. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today. We are Lullabot, and it's very nice to meet you. Um, and my name is Brian Scourin. I'm Lullabot's president. And uh, today I'm going to be moderating a panel discussion titled we Rewiring Lullabot, a retrospective on the how and why of becoming employee owned. So in case you didn't know, back in uh, tw January of 2021, Lullabot made a transition from being privately owned uh, to being an employee owned company under an ESOP model. Um, ESOP stands for, what does it stand for? Employee Stock Ownership Plan. That's right. And so I am joined today by members of Lullabot's leadership team, and we're going to talk about the, the transition to being employee owned, how everything went down, and uh, you know what we learned along the way. And uh, fortunately, it was a, a little less painless, a little less painful than what's pictured here. Um, that actually used to be our 404 page on our website, but we launched a new website, so check it out. Um, so let's start with very quickly, uh, in case not everybody knows, let's start with who the heck is Lullabot? So this is Lullabot. Um, <laughs> this is at our, our most recent company retreat. Uh, a lot of people in the Drupal community know Lullabot already. Uh, we've been around since 2006, uh, exclusively focused on Drupal. This was, by the way, our silly picture at our retreat in Palm <laughs> Springs uh, back in February. We're about 70 people now. And uh, as of 2021, all of these people are now employee owners, which is pretty cool. So, um, so joining me today is, uh, you can see that, that jumping person in the back, or I don't know, are, are you just standing? I guess. Okay. <laughs> and Karen, I think, is in the front row. Yeah, front row. Front row. Yeah. So let's start with intros. Um, Seth. Hi everyone, um, my name is Seth Brown. I'm Lullabot's CEO, current CEO. There uh, have been two before me, one of whom is also here today, Jeff Robbins. Um, and uh, so I'm the third CEO. I hail from Carbondale, Colorado. Um, and uh, my background was an agency background. Uh, there was a local agency that I joined as sort of the third person and we, we sat in a server room in 2003 and. And that company grew to be uh, 60 people. And so having been through that growth, I came to Lullabot and had something to offer as Lullabot started to um, open up their client services part of the business um, and transition from being a consulting company. So that was kind of where I fit into Lullabot in 2010. And yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to Karen. Uh, yeah, I'm Karen Stevenson. I'm currently the COO of Lullabot. Um, I did uh, engineering, I did architecture, um, did a lot of stuff with Drupal, CCK, date, calendar, all those kinds of things, um, and joined Lullabot in 2009. Um, but before I was doing all that, I was a CPA for 20 years, uh, which turned out to be really handy when you're doing a, an ESOP because you need a whole lot of uh, financial stuff. Uh, with, so uh, turned out to be uh, pretty handy. Um, Let's see, I think that's it. Yeah. And so uh, one way to think about Seth and Karen on this panel is Seth is kind of the voice of management and uh, executive leadership, and Karen is kind of the voice of tax, legal, administration. Um, and But now Karen is actually chairperson of our board of directors as of uh, this year. So um, she can speak from that perspective as well, um, which is super exciting. And uh, yeah, and we were gonna close out this panel with a third person who could speak from the HR perspective uh, named Chris Conratty, but unfortunately she got ill uh, right before the, the DrupalCon, so she couldn't make it. But she's very, very much here in spirit, and uh, we are collectively going to try to be one Chris and uh, answer <laughs> HR questions as Chris would. Um, and will probably not do nearly as well as she would. But uh, yeah, so to kick, off, to kick this off, 
um, I want to you know sort of ask the question, uh, who's here? Let's get a sense of the audience so we can know kind of like who we're talking to and, and what you all care about. Um, so quick show of hands. Who here owns or manages a digital agency? All right. Uh, who works at a digital agency? Okay, good amount of people. Um, who, who is with another type of organization? Okay. And lastly, who is with Lullabot? <laughs> Woo! All right. Oh, good amount. Thanks for filling the bleachers. <laughs> um, nice. Well, okay, let's get started. So first question, very simply, uh, what is an ESOP and how does it work? And I'm going to throw that to Karen. Okay. Uh, so as, as we mentioned at the beginning, ESOP means Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Uh, and the idea is uh, it's a type of organization where the employees own the company. You know, every company has an owner. Um, and traditionally, our, our historically, our uh, owners were Matt and Jeff, who started the company. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to have a transition to a point where the employees own the company. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. And the ESOP is a very structured, very uh, well thought out way of managing it. Uh, and actually what happens is we create a trust. The trust is actually a retirement plan and the retirement plan owns the company. And then all the employees are beneficiaries of the retirement plan. So it's, it's a kind of a funny thing. Employees are not directly owners of the company. They don't get little shares of stock themselves, but they participate in this retirement plan and they accumulate uh, value over the years. And when they leave, um, they get whatever the current value of the company is, and they get to take their, their part of that uh, when they leave. So they transition from um, you know, regular em being regular employees that don't have any stake in the outcome to people that are uh, definitely have a stake in the outcome. Yeah, and since it's a retirement plan, is, uh, is that governed under like ERISA? Right, it's actually very much like a 401k, except it's a plan that just owns the company stock. You know, in a regular 401k, you have lots of different stocks that you have in your 401k. In this particular one, there's nothing but Lullabot stock in there. And in fact, all the Lullabot stock is in there. That's why it's 100%. Uh, you know, ESOPs are not always 100%. Sometimes they're partial, but in our case, it's 100%. So 100% of the ownership of the company now belongs to the ESOP. So that sounds complicated. <laughs> um, Turns out it is. <laughs> so what? So what? Um, what's involved in in a trans transaction like that? Like how do you? How does a company go from being privately owned to being yeah. an ESOP? Like how does that go down? Uh, the first thing, obviously, is figuring out if that's what you want to do. And there were, that was a, a long, kind of lengthy process of talking to a lot of people, talking to, to uh, professionals that have organize these kinds of things, talking to uh, other companies that have done it, um, figuring out how it worked, talking to employees of the other companies that have done it to see, did it mean anything to them? Did it, was it worth it? That kind of thing. Uh, so it was a really, it was a really slow process. Um, the, ironically, we, uh, Matt started talking about this uh, several years ago and originally thought we wouldn't be able to do it till maybe 2026. And um, then the COVID came and everything kind of changed and um, we started talking about it again and realized we could do it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was kind, of, kind of surprising to us that we, we could do it sooner than we thought we could do it, but we could. Um, and so we, we took action at that point and, and made it happen. Yeah. Ironically, the, the attorney that guided us through the thing early early on we said you know how complicated is this how much time is it going to take and what did what did he sell, tell us it was yeah he, he's like oh yeah you'll you know you don't, won't have to do much you'll think about <laughs> it a couple times we'll fill out some docs for you and then you'll be an esop and yeah. we thought oh that yeah. sounds good yeah. I like don't, that. Believe yeah. Yeah. don't believe attorneys uh -huh. don't believe attorneys never yeah, believe. yeah. 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 right <laughs> so yeah. it was it was involved it was very involved it was well worth it but it was it was very time-consuming and complicated. About how long did it take 
start to finish, uh, you know, from <laughs> let's begin doing an ESOP to, okay, now yeah. we are an ESOP. I think Matt and I became really engaged with the legal team probably six months before we actually, um, and then Karen got very, very involved probably <laughs> four, three or four months out. Um, and so it was, it, it certainly takes a, it exerts a huge um, time cost on the executive team. And so that's something to consider if you're a, uh, you know, owner thinking about doing this is can you carve out enough time to give this the attention, you know, f away from your other responsibilities. And <laughs> the pandemic was kind of unique in, in a couple of facets for us. One, business was great for digital agencies um, after a certain point. Uh, and then we also received PPP money um, as part of the uh, payroll protection plan, which we were definitely concerned at the time that we put in for that, but then we ended up not needing it as the market sort of bounced back after March um, of 2020. And so we, we ended up using that money to help fund this ESOP uh, process, which you know cost north of $300,000 um, know, to, to actually do all of the legal work, the administrative work, get, hire the TPA, pay the trustee, like all of those things. And that's just the year zero expense. Um, and then there's also ongoing costs of around 60,000 a year that the company pays. But the amazing thing about being an S Corp ESOP, and we can talk a little bit about the, the differences, but to whatever extent you are an ESOP, so you know 10% or 100% like Lullabot, you, you are forgiven in your taxes, your federal taxes on your profits up to that point. So for us, you know, we're 100% ESOP, we don't pay federal taxes. And that money helps us a lot in terms of paying for all of these expenses, mm -hmm. um, that savings, as well as builds wealth for the employees and helps you to buy out the exited owners. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I was, I was gonna ask, so you know, given it's this multi-month process and there's a lot of work involved, um, you know, at a high level, like really briefly, can you kind of talk about what were some of the things that we had to do in that process that were so time consuming? Yeah, there were, I, I would put it into two or three buckets of things. So one bucket of things was understanding the ESOP and making, you, when you set up an ESOP, you have to make a lot of decisions. There's a lot of ways that you can implement ESOPs and we had a whole lot of, we are sort of a recipe of, you could do this thing or this thing or this thing. And, and we had to understand what the options were as best we could without actually knowing what we were doing. Um, and so you have to make all these decisions and you have to understand how the ESOP works and you have to get all that, all those decisions in place. So that's kind of one bucket of work that took a long time. The second thing is you have to get all the stock back from all the existing owners because if you're gonna give the stock to the ESOP, you have to have it back again. And basically what's happening if you, I don't know if anybody here has ever been through a purchase or a sale of, of a company, that's effectively what this is. So you've gotta do all the things that are involved in a purchase or a sale of a company, including all the due diligence, you know, all the records, you know, all your taxes, all your sales, you know, all your clients, you know, what, how do things look? Do you have a management team? And that was a big one. What management team do you have in place? Mm -hmm. In our case, our owners were exiting, but we had a management team in place that was gonna stay, and that was critical. Like, if the owners had also been the management team and they were leaving, that would, that would have been really difficult to make that work. But we had a management team in place that was gonna stay, so that made it something that was doable. Um, but you have to go through all the work that basically is involved uh, in a purchase, and the idea is, you. One of the very first things you do is you hire the trustee, and the trustee is basically looking out for the interests of the employee. You know, this is a retirement plan. There's a lot of rules around all this. The retirement plan cannot overpay for the company, so they got, they need to make sure that it's been priced fairly, that they're you know that that there's a reasonable price for the company, that it makes sense, all that kind of thing. So you you have to get a formal valuation done. You have to do all the due diligence work as though you were selling the company to the trustee. And at the same time, you're buying back the company from the owners. So you've got all that work going on. So you've got this repurchase of the stock from the original owners and then this deal to sell the stock then to the ESOP. And ESOP's going to do all the 
due diligence on their side of it. So that's where all the work comes from, and it is a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work, a lot of work. Yeah, and that third-party valuation is really interesting because when you're doing this transition as management or owners, you're sort of both the buyer and the seller. So in that regard, you really have to be the seller and give all of this information and disclose. Um, but then a price comes back, and the DOL and the IRS are very interested in the employees getting a fair price. Um, it's, I think they call it adequate consideration. Um, and it's you know a legal standard um, that gets bandied about and argued about and fought in, in case law. But overall, if you are exiting as an owner to a sale to another company or to a, you know, a private market, private equity, you're likely to get more for the company than you will selling to an ESOP because of that factor, because the, the DOL and the IRS have exerted their you know, considerable influence on making sure that these prices are fair to the employees buying the company, so to speak. The DOL, for those that don't Department know, of Department, Department of the Labor and IRS Internal Revenue Service. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, and to close out this this sort of what is an ESOP section, um, so we were, we were actually just talking before this. Uh, we had this question, uh, what are some well-known ESOPs? There are ESOPs everywhere. There are tons of ESOPs out there. Um, and we sat down and we were like, what are some well-known ESOPs? And we didn't really know. So, uh, but I think we brainstormed a few um, that we, you know, that are pretty well-known. Um, Publix is one, right? Public supermarkets, King Arthur Flower, uh, what else? Um, New Belgium Brewery was one and then they, they sold, um, but they were employee-owned. Um, and you can you can go from being an ESOP back to being a private company or to, to being a public company. There's you know it's just an, another sale of the company. Uh, Cliff Bar is partly an ESOP. Um, they they have an ESOP. A public company can have an ESOP uh, own a certain amount of the shares, uh, and Cliff Bar is one that does that. Yeah, most of the companies that are ESOPs are private. Yep. Um, which makes sense. If, if if employees own it, it's by definition a private company. It's not a public company, uh, so because of that, a lot of a lot of these names are probably not necessarily names everyone would recognize. But it's really all kinds of industries. So there's a lot of grocery stores, there's engineering firms, there's construction companies, um, almost anything that you can think of. There's there's probably an example of someone that's in ESOP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, manufacturing. It's very big in manufacturing, especially like if it's in the U.S. Um, because it's a great way to attract and retain labor, and that's a big challenge for manufacturing companies um, in the U.S. Yeah, one other point I was gonna I, w I was gonna make about we you talked about the idea that that the um, owner wouldn't necessarily get as much money selling to the ESOP as they would to to the broader market, you know, just selling out to some third party. But the other consideration that comes up and the reason that I think the ESOP has really been successful and is a, a really interesting solution is, um, I, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it was really a good point. It was, a, good it was a really good point. <laughs> it did, yeah. No, it was, it was the, uh, if, if you've got a company and you want to maintain the culture of the company and you're worried about what happens, because a lot of times if you sell to a third party, you know, the bet's off mm -hmm. what's going to happen after that. Uh, if somebody spends a lot of money for a company, they're going to come in, they're going to cut costs, they're going to be kind of stringent. Culture's probably going to change. Yeah. A lot of things are probably going to change. And if you have built something and you would want to see it live on kind of as the thing that you created, an ESOP is really nice. And again, it all the key to the whole thing is you have to have management that continues through the process. So as long as you've taken care of the management piece, that works. But it, it really is an interesting solution if you want to do that. Yeah. And you must have known what my next slide was going to be. Ah, was that your next question? Why an ESOP? <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the mechanics of an ESOP are, at some level pretty complicated and not always exciting depending on your background. But, you know, I think one of the things that is exciting about an ESOP is, you know, the, the motivation around it. Why an ESOP? And um, I'm going to throw this one to Seth. You know, what was the, you were there from the genesis of the ESOP idea. What, what was the why behind it? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of credit on this front, I think, goes to, to Matt and Jeff. They um, saw that, you know, at some point they were going to want to transition out of their, you know, day-to-day -day roles in Lullabot and wondered how Lullabot could remain a going concern, could keep our culture. Um, we had been approached over the years uh, with acquisition uh, offers that we declined, partly because the, the uh, offerer you know, was looking to make a talent acquisition and had basically said openly, well, we're gonna bring in, you know, these six or seven engineers and then everyone else, well, but we're gonna let them go, you know, or something like that. And of course we'd be like, no, we, we would never want to do that. Right, Elia? <laughs> 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 Sorry, inside joke. I should never do that in front of a large audience. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, you know, Matt and Jeff, really wanted to um, at some point exit and also have a way to perpetuate what they had built, the culture that we had as a company. Um, and Inesop sort of came forward as the best way to do that. Matt got really interested in some of the work that Jack Stack had done with the great game of business and stake in the outcome and started going to conferences and then he brought us to conferences and we got interested and it was a very vibrant community. Like if you engage in the Aesop community, it feels a lot can feel a lot like DrupalCon. You know, you go and everyone is so excited and passionate about employee ownership. We had several Lullabots go this year. Um, Nick, you were there, and I think some others that may be here that were there, but um, it's very inspiring to go to an ESOP conference because, you know, at one level, it's this really nerdy, esoteric, like, you know, finance and tax structure, but at the other side of the, like, this is literally the anecdote to everything that's wrong with capitalism, right? Like, you're actually sharing ownership and risk against the people who are doing the work. And you're also aligning the incentives of the shareholders with the incentives of the employees 100% which is a huge problem for a lot of businesses, right? Like oftentimes what the shareholders want is not at all what the employees want at many companies. And those things can come into conflict in, you know, obvious ways. So I think, I think there's, there's some wonderful things about an ESOP and the more you do get involved in the community and start to understand what's really at stake, the more exciting it becomes and, and sort of the less of an esoteric, like, you know, thought exercise it is. So now that we've like actually been through it though, and now that we are in ESOP and we're seeing the impacts, uh, do you feel like it's achieved those original goals that we sort of had in mind, these lofty ideals of, of what it would be? Yeah, I mean, I would look to the lullabots probably for some validation here, but I, I feel like it has. I mean, at, at one level, it's sort of like when, you, when you're first starting out as an ESOP, when you're a baby ESOP, you know, people kind of look at their first share price when they get their first statement and they, they have this moment where they're like doing the math, thinking, huh, okay, this in $4 and I could get a Starbucks, like, thank you. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a little more than that, but it's not significant. But the idea is that it's gonna grow um, literally by, you know, this year, triple percentage. Our stock price went up 366% this year um, in our, our first official year of starting to pay down debt and be an ESOP. So, I think as you grow and the employees start to see that this value is building, you know, if you think of it as sort of the analogy of a house purchase, you know, if you were to buy a house with no money down, right, like you don't have a lot of equity to begin with on that first day, especially if your house was valued properly. But then as you own the house, as you continue to work on it, and as the, you pay down the mortgage and the house starts to increase in value, you know, all of a sudden that equity value starts to go up in the house. and so. Our stock price is a derivative of the, the equity value that we all have um, in, in Lullabot. And so we're, now that we're starting to see that increase, I think that part is getting more concrete and more real. But I still feel like at our first retreat, um, Jared made these wonderful shirts for everyone that we, we used to have a bot camp um, that we'd go to every year. And our first year as an ESOP, Jared, our creative director, our chief creative officer made us shirts that said owner's camp and there was just a different feeling at that first retreat as an ESOP 
where everyone was like, holy cow, we own this thing. This is our company. And I felt like the types of questions that I, were, I was getting from people, which had often been over the years more of along the lines of their professional development or you know, suddenly those things flipped around and it was like, I have this great idea for something that I really think could move the chains for Lullabot and I'd like to see if we can, uh, that's a football analogy, sorry, it's probably a <laughs> wrong audience. <laughs> but um, you know, th that like, you know, this, this could have a real impact on the business. And that change was really evident and inspiring even at our first retreat. And even before this was as tangible as having received our first statements. Um, and I think that's continued to grow. So yeah, I think it really has been successful in that regard. And it also accomplished something that is very difficult for privately held companies, but is very real, which is at some point the owners want to exit and there's just not that many ways to do that in a private company where the stock is not freely bought and sold. You know, you can mm -hmm. shut it down, you can, you know, leave it to, s to a, a child, you could try to, you know, sell it to people that want to buy those shares, but then they have tax implications for owning that, that stock. It's very complicated, and so that's why so often in M&A, you end up selling to another company. Um, and this is a way to not have to do that, which is quite magical, in fact. Actually, th that's another point that I was going to bring up is, um, I mean, you could, you could literally sell the company to the employees, like give them stock or sell mm -hmm. them stock, but that actually creates a lot of additional problems. If they directly own stock, they've got taxes, they've got uh, problems to deal with, the value of that thing goes up and down, it pushes up their personal income, does all kinds of complicated things, it, and it's taxable, it's gonna be, gonna be taxable income to them. Uh, whereas in the ESOP, they've got effectively the same thing. It's not taxed. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a retirement plan. It's not mm -hmm. taxable income uh, to them until they d take it out after they retire. And even, the, even after they retire, they can roll it over into another retirement plan because it's retirement money. So they can put, uh, postpone the time that they would actually have to pay taxes on it, you know, pretty far off into the future which makes a big difference. Yeah, it's a, it's a really elegant solution for as, as complica complicated as it is. Yeah. Um, and you know, the follow-up question I had here, which I think is an obvious answer, uh, but you know, in retrospect, would you do it again? And I think for yep. all of us, the Absolutely. answer is like, yes. 100%. Um, one question, is there, were there any other alternative solutions to like achieve the same goals that were considered along the way or anything? Is there anything out there that, you know, achieves employee ownership that is not an ESOP? I mean, you kind of talked a little bit about that, no. Karen, but. Yeah. I mean, as an S Corp, you can have a hundred shareholders. So if you were a, you know, small to medium sized digital agency, you could start having your team buy stock. You could gross up their pay in order to allow them to pay the taxes on that stock. You know, they could file their taxes like we used to have to do as shareholders of Lullabot in nine or 10 different states um, and deal with all of the, the challenges that they're in. But there's, you know, again, it's, there's liability, there's tax implications, there's all kinds of things that you circumvent by having this trust sit in between the owners, or which are the beneficiaries of the trust and the trust itself and the company. So, you know, that yeah, there, there are alternatives and we, we had actually utilized several of them. A, a lot of Lullabots who were here before the ESOP had stock options. All of those had to be um, bought out when we made this transition. You know, all the stock had to be sold back to the company. So, you know, there are ways to do this and I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room who owns an agency has, has thought about them, but I just think that the ESOP kind of just solves problems you didn't even realize you were going to have. That's the magic of it. It's like there's so many years, you know, since 1974 we've been doing this. Um, you know, everything's sort of been litigated. It's a fairly stable, accomplished, you know, space, and, and it's a good way to do this. And you can't really anticipate all the challenges that you're going to have, but ESOP law has sort of already done that, and it's often built into these plans that are pre-approved by the IRS, essentially, um, with, within you know certain range of choices that you can make. Um, and your law firm sort of helps you navigate all of that, but mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now. So we've been talking from the perspective of 
management and ownership, you know, prior exited ownership. Um, let's talk about the impact on employees. And you talked a little bit about this in terms of, you know, the cultural impacts that we saw. Um, but I'm kind of curious um, how much, like, let's talk about governance a little bit. How much control do employees have over the ESOP or the company? Um, you know, how, how does the ESOP help in hiring and retention? You know, th those sorts of things. Like, what's, what's been kind of the employee impact? I realize that's a weird question with employees sitting right here in front of us. Uh, but You're a much better answer. Yeah, we probably talk to any Lullabot employee afterwards. But we are also Lullabot employees we as are, well. Yeah. And, yeah. You know. We are employee owners too. Yeah, Yeah. so I, I mean, I'll do governance and you do retention. Okay, okay so it, governance does change in some ways, but not in the ways you might expect. And so what do I mean by that? Well. When you have a trustee, they're gonna wanna see a board of directors and they're gonna want that board of directors to be comprised of several independent board members who are not at all connected to you or the, you know, the ownership of the company, right? They want uh, independent eyes um, and, and the, the standard that an ESOP board is held to, um, I think is in many cases is of a prudent expert. So you actually are held to a pretty high standard of jurisprudence in terms of your, your need to watch over and be aware of what's going on in the company. Um, so there were some famous cases where there was nepotism afoot and you know a board of directors would be packed with someone's family and nobody was paying any attention. And meanwhile, you know, the rogue CEO who was, you know, say the, the son of the family went off and did something incredibly you know, illegal or irresponsible and then the other family members who were holding these passive board seats actually got sued and were held, you know, actually liable for not having paid attention. And so the, the standard for ESOP board members is actually fairly high. And we, so we had to go out and find those independent board members um, and, and get them to join and, and actually pay them. It's a professional role. Um, the team knows them now. They've come to our retreats. Um, and ultimately, the board is, you know, the, the authority. Um, I sit on the board as CEO. Karen is chair of the board, but then we have three other independent board members um, who, who are the majority, essentially. And they comprise certain key committees, like the compensation committee. Um, so they look after our pay to make sure that it's fair relative to the rest of Lullabot and the other employees. Um, and they do other sorts of things where Karen and I might have a, a natural conflict of interest as both managers and board members, you know, those things will go to the independent board to be handled. Um, and I as CEO and Karen as COO and Brian as president report directly to the board. Um, and if one of us is to leave, the board is actually the one that would replace us. They would be the, you know, the board would be in charge with finding the new CEO or not. Now we would definitely have uh, the ability to advise in that process and Karen and I would be involved in the decision and we've always talked about wanting those that to come from inside of Lullabot. But it's still those sorts of things become considerations when you're thinking about governance of an ESOP. And if you've been you know, a single private owner of an agency, that could be a big change for you, right? If you, you know, because you're essentially a, hopefully a benign dictator of your own uh, concern at that point. But when you be, if you were to become an ESOP, you're gonna have to take on an independent board. Um, and so that changes things. Um, it doesn't change things though in the way that I think some people might expect or think, which is, well, doesn't that mean that we all vote on anything, right? Like the idea that now we're a completely flat organization and a democracy and any decision that the company needs to make should be voted on by all the shareholders. And that's not actually the way that the ESOP uh, works and, and not the way that most companies work. And ESOP in, in, a, in one sense is just a fairly normal company. It's got a board of directors, it's got a leadership level, it makes decisions, and there are certain things that shareholders do by law get to vote on. And those things are like recapitalization, sale of substantially all of the shares of the company, those sorts of things. So there's a few things which, you know, and this doesn't even come back to ESOP law, this actually goes back to just general corporate law, right? There's certain rights as shareholders that you have if you're a stock owner in Starbucks you know, where you would vote on these things if you were, you know, a shareholder. So the shareholders vote on similar things to, you know, that you might in a public company. 
but it doesn't you know, necessarily translate to the day-to-day -day or tactical or even strategic operations of the company, which are still in the hands of the executive team and the board. Which part am I answering now? Uh, well, I forgot retention. the question. The retention. Uh, retention. Yeah. Yes. Hiring and retention. Uh, yeah. So, um, so the other part of this is uh, the question is, do we have we seen any impact on retention and hiring? And I would say absolutely. Uh, a lot of people ask questions. We we um, say pretty prominently in our um, ads when we uh, hire that we're employee owned and people often ask about it. If they don't already know about it, they, they're curious. They want to know what that's all about. Uh, we know it in at least a couple of situations. Um, it's been the deciding point between uh, one job and another has been, oh, this one's employee owned, that sounds better. Um, the, the ability to accumulate some stock. Uh, so it's done that. Uh, we went through uh, the great resignation when a lot of companies saw a lot of people leave we did not see a lot of people leave. We had a really, um, we really hung on to people. And I don't know that that's because of the ESOP, but I, it may be one of the factors that uh, caused people to stay. It was definitely correlated, right? Yeah, right. I think it yeah. helps. Yeah. I, I think it does help. I mean, the Great Recession statistic that Chris had was, you know, 37% turnover for m most companies. And we, we were around 10%, I think 11 officially, but, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, and that's been a typical number for us since the ESOP. Um, so we've had pretty low turnover. And yeah, I think it is attractive and interesting. I, I almost think the spirit of it can be as important to some people as the actuality. And hopefully the actuality is going to get more interesting over years um, as the ESOP continues to grow in value. Um, but I think, you know, there's many lullabots who, you know, uh, might say something like "eat the rich," and uh, <laughs> I actually heard that recently in, at a retreat. And uh, it's like I hope they don't mean me because I promise I'm not. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, the spirit of equality is is very real, and and the sense the equity is genuine equity in a financial and sort of stock sense of the word. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Like you know, one one of the questions that we had is does this ESOP factor into our DEI efforts? You know, is this, do we consider this to be part of our diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts? Um, I, I, I think, yes, probably. Um, hopefully, being owners of the company is, is a part of making everyone equal, making, putting everyone on the same footing, giving everyone the same opportunity to participate and benefit from the things that they're doing. Um, I think that's one of the things that's really exciting about the ESOP is, is that. And in terms of like the equity that we're building, not to get too in the weeds with it, but uh, is it actually, does everybody accrue equal equity uh, value or is that like, how does that Yeah, work? The, t the typical way that ESOPs work and, and we, um, we're kind of stuck with the typical way that ESOPs work because if we veer too far off of that, we run the risk of we're going to have to have uh, Seth's, Seth's example is forking. Like we've got a standard plan that's been approved by the IRS, and if we want to change the plan, we'd be forking, and then we'd have to maintain our fork, and that gets really complicated. And the idea is we we want to maintain things that other people are doing that are proven, that are approved, all that kind of thing. And so the typical way that, um, in, in I, as far as I can tell, is not even just typical, it's like almost the only way that uh, stock is allocated is based on wages. Fortunately, our wages in our company are pretty equal. We, we work pretty hard to not have a huge gap between um, the wages at the top and the wages at the bottom. Uh, but the way that it generally works is, uh, in our case, we have 50,000 shares that we allocate each year. And this is not a purchase. Employees don't have to purchase it. They are given. So that's benefit number one. So they get the stock. We take the 50,000 shares. Uh, we divvy it up pro rata based on wages. Um, and the other advantage of doing something like wages is if somebody was working part time, they would get a smaller piece than somebody who's working full time, that kind of thing, which does seem reasonable. Uh, so we allocate the shares based on wages. Uh, but again, in our case, that tends to be pretty equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
it, it would, on its own, you know, allocating equity uh, based on salary is could be very unequal. So yeah. it if really needs to equal, be paired be a with, problem. Yep. with uh, you know, some, some yeah. good thinking around, you know, what is your salary equity, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, that's an important aspect of it for sure. There's legislation too around um, the 409, I think it's 409P, um, which has tests to make sure that the ESOP is not being distributed unequally. So like, let's say you were a normal public company and your CEO to average salary ratio was something like 350 to, to one or something crazy like that, right? In that scenario, you would actually trip the 409P clause, which d which does not allow you to have disqualified persons who hold more than 10% of the stock or, or families that hold more than 10%. So there's all sorts of legal mechanisms that the IRS and the DOL have used to sort of constrain corruption, nepotism, and the other ways that the ESOP could be misused. And it has been misused. Some people might remember a very notable uh, ESOP named Enron. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, subsequent to Enron, there was a lot more <laughs> scrutiny on ESOPs um, and the ways that they could be misused. And, and legislation has kind of caught up to, to make sure these things don't happen. But yeah. Um, the other thing about the DOL, so one in three baby ESOPs get audited, and you don't really want to be audited. It's kind of like an IRS, like you don't want the attention of the DOL and the IRS. So following the standard plan, following the standard playbook is a way of sort of not raising your hand and say, hey, look at us, we're special, you know, because the people that are going to pay attention are not the ones that you really want to have interactions with. Kind of, you mean is it Repeat. akin to, yeah. yeah, sorry, the question is, is the 409P clause like the safe harbor? Um, I don't know. I'll turn I, don't, I don't know if it's technically the safe harbor, but it is definitely. 409P, basically, there's only one thing that can happen if you fail the 409P. Your, for, your ESOP is gone. It doesn't, it's gone. It, there's, no, there's no way to fix it. You, you've lost your ESOP. So it's pretty uh, stringent. Yeah, well, on that note, let's talk finances. Um, and I, are there, we, we talked a little bit, we've, we've been you know, sort of moving around. You mentioned uh, some of the expenses around starting up the ESOP. Um, now that we are an operating ESOP, what, are there any extra expenses or different expenses as compared to private yeah. company? Now, as, as we said before, we don't have to pay income taxes, fortunately, and that's because the owner of the company is a retirement plan, and retirement plans don't owe income taxes, so that's fundamentally what's going on there. Uh, but on the other hand, we, uh, we have to have a trustee. We don't have to have an external trustee. We chose to have an external trustee. There are some companies that act as their own trustee, but it introduces, again, the chance that you're gonna get yourself in trouble Having an external trustee just gives you an, a little extra buffer of somebody who isn't you making sure that you're following the rules and that you're being fair to the employees and all those kinds of things. So we have an external trustee and they charge us every year. Um, we have to get a valuation every year, a formal valuation, because that's a whole part of the, every year we do a valuation and then we issue statements to everybody and say, here's what your stock is worth now. Um, we're just expecting to get our statements here uh, pretty soon, any time now. Um, uh, and then we have to have a third party administrator and that's third party administrator is actually does things like manage everybody's individual accounts and figure out how much, how much stock gets allocated to who and who has what and how much is vested and uh, they produce the statements and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so principal is our, uh, is our third party administrator. Uh, so we have those three professionals. We have legal expenses, which come and go, depends on if, you know, once we got past the initial legal expenses of the initial um, creation of the ESOP, there's ongoing legal expenses. Questions come up. Um, either the valuation company may have questions, the trustee may have questions, or we may have questions. We pay for the legal expenses no matter who has the questions. Um, but so that can come up. Um, and then we do have to think about cash uh, because ultimately one of the things we have to worry about is what's called a repurchase obligation. It's not an issue yet. It will become an issue at some point. 
because the whole point of this thing is that when people leave, they can get paid. And this is, this is actually one of the beautiful things. It's, it's a problem and it's something to think about, but it's also one of the beautiful things about the ESOP. So if we had sold stock individually to employees, we'd still have that problem. How are we going to, you know, how are they going to actually get money for their stock ultimately? Uh, with an ESOP, it's all very structured. It's all written out. We know exactly what it is. There's actually formulas that you can run. The third party administrator has programs that we can run to anticipate what our, um, what our uh, repurchase obligation is going to be, when we need how much money, when, you know, based on expected dates of, you know, ex expectations about turnover and retirement and all those kinds of things. They, they have all the calculations built in. Uh, and so as we grow, we have to be thinking about a repurchase obligation. And basically part of our responsibility is make sure that we've got enough cash so that when people do need to get paid out, that there'll be something there that they can get paid out, um, which again, with a, a typical individual private company is not something that's in place. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, there's a question. There's a million shares uh, allocated over, sorry, the question was, um, why 50,000 shares per year? Oh, and, and the, the vesting. vesting. Okay, yeah, we can talk about both of those. So first of all, um, the shares are allocated over a period of 20 years. Um, there are a million shares, so 50,000 shares per year, um, which gives you a decent runway. Most companies statistically will cha change hands every you know, 10 to 15 years. So that's sort of building that into the, the expectation. Um, as far as vesting goes, so you get your shares each year but you vest over six years. Um, and so it, there is also that, that's both a way to retain employees, but it's also a way to be able to afford your repurchase obligation. It's, a, it's a, a mechanism to give you enough time to build up the cash that you're going to need to be able to start buying people out. Um, it also avoids what you might call the quit and buy a house problem which is like if you started to have a really valuable share in an ESOP and you could just cash out tomorrow and it, it, w it was sitting there as like this big Easter egg thing, oh, I could, I could just cash out and have a down payment for that house. Um, you know, this avoids that problem because, sorry, this doesn't. But th there's also another clause here, which is that you get bought out over a period of time. So you vest over six years and then you also get paid out over five. And so the paid out over five is a way to avoid that problem of like, you know, I'm over 55, I'm gonna go ahead and cash out my ESOP right now in one lump sum because I wanna go do something, buy a house or whatever. And you know, so th there's a waiting period. So, sorry, I may go back. Uh, oh no, you're <laughs> fine. Um, and we are, we're approaching the end of our time here, I believe, um, but I, I do wanna kind of uh, close and say, uh, you know, all everything that we've talked about is complicated. Uh, there's an extra layer of complication, which is uh, international employees that right. we, we didn't even get to we talk about. Um, but, you know, let's sort of end. I would love to hear both of your answers around um, any surprises, like what any surprises or delights now that this is done what didn't match your expectations, uh, both good and bad? And then we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, I talked a little bit about this um, when I was interviewed for the Talking Drupal podcast, but one of the surprising things um, to consider if you're becoming an ESOP is what impact will it have on innovation in your company? Um, and one of, the re you know, one of the reasons that an ESOP is good is because everyone has ownership and wants to see the company grow, innovate, expand, all those other things. But at the same time, when you're a privately held you know, company with a single owner, um, that owner can pretty much pivot the company tomorrow if that's what they feel like doing. They can, they can decide to invest the company's profits um, in whatever they want to. You know, They could decide they want to build apps instead of Drupal websites or something like that and just completely switch. And when you're an ESOP, you're beholden to your shareholders, to your board, like there's all of these other layers involved. And so I think 
one way to think of it is, you know, you're no longer the, the cigarette boat that can just pivot on a dime. You're a much larger vessel that can turn a little bit more slowly and with a lot more oversight and control. Um, so I, I think that that can cut both ways when it comes to innovation. You have, you know, maybe more inspired a team, hopefully, but at the same time, you know, there's a little bit more inherent red tape um, in being an ESOP. And that can, and one person's vision doesn't necessarily get to dominate the conversation and what the company's going to do. Um, and so that's a different dynamic. And I, you know, I think that's worth considering. What about surprise. you, Karen? Surprises? Uh, yeah. Um, well, my one surprise was, was the time. I wasn't really expecting how much time it would take. Um, but I, I, again, still feel like it was 100% worth it. And as far as the pivoting and everything, um, the, the, alter the alternate to that would be to say less risk, right? I mean, this is all about kind of reducing the risk. Um, a, a little more steady company, a little slower growing, a little more carefully thought through uh, than you necessarily were um, when you had one owner who was only playing with his own money, basically. Um, you now you're playing with everybody's money, so mm -hmm. you you need you need to be careful. But again, I, I think the biggest surprise to me was I, I had not really known much about ESOPs, and I knew a lot about different ways that people exited companies and things like that, but had never really thought about it as boy, this is a really nice way to transition a company to the next step, to the next stage. Um, it's got a lot of a lot of good things going for it. Awesome. Well, thank you both. We'll wrap it up there. Um, we are, I know, there may be questions. Can I have a surprise? <laughs> okay. Um, there was a really interesting thing that happened that I have to sort of, you know, have my, my thinking about, about an ESOP. And it was really hard to do, I mean, you're saying it was more agile, but it was hard to do things, uh, let's just say, if we wanted to grow the company in some way. If you ask the average low about what they thought about that, Great point. Yeah, growth is way more baked in, and people are more accepting and and uh, um, open to growth as a as a motiv motivating factor for our business. So we'll wrap it up there because we're a little bit over time. But uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, we were straight from here. We're gonna go to Lullabot's Expo Hall booth. So if you have, we didn't have time for Q and A. If anybody has questions, feel free to grab one of the three of us or any Lullabot employee and talk. And then uh, Lullabot has a party tonight at seven o'clock at Coupe de Ville and come out. Thank you very much.